Good morning. Wonderful to be back here among all of you, seeing your lovely faces here as we prepare to together hear our Lord's words of life and salvation for us. Now, while the front, the front of your bulletin says the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, Pastor Schrader and I have decided to do a sermon series. Pretty much everything in the service is all geared around that sermon series. So our themes today are vocation and witness. And I don't know if you noticed or not, depending on whether you've got a large print bulletin or a regular print bulletin, but most of our hymns are on extra sheets this morning, all right? The way that apparently just kind of shook out was that we only have one hymn that's actually from our hymnal, and we're not using the hymnals this morning for our hymns, so go figure. <laughs> Uh, starting in July, though, we are going to try to go back to using the hymnal a bit more. Um, it helps us to cut down on paper when we don't have to print it in all of the bulletins and, uh, and different things like that. And in fact, you might even have an opportunity to use your bulletin this morning during the sermon, but we'll get there. Uh, thank you all for being here with us this morning for worship. God's peace be with you. Thank you. <laughs>
make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We continue with our intro it from Psalm chapter 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Confident that God's favor is for a lifetime, and that joy comes with the morning, let us confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I admit and confess my sinfulness. I have turned away from others in my thinking, speaking, and doing. I have done the evil you forbid, and have not done the good you demand. I do repent, and am truly sorry for these my sins. Have mercy on me, because of the obedience of your Son. Forgive all my sins, And by the Holy Spirit, move me to serve you faithfully, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Gospel, Jesus answered the prayers of a synagogue leader named Jairus and a sick woman because they trusted in him. Our Lord left his heavenly riches and became poor so that he could not only cure illness and physical death, but by his death and resurrection, offer us the riches of heaven. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue with Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, whose steadfast love never ceases, Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, who has enriched us through your poverty, Lord, have mercy. O Holy Spirit, who has given us faith to trust that joy comes with the morning, Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We continue with our hymn of praise.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for this morning's scripture readings. Our readings this morning are from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 8 to 11, as well as Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. The Holy Spirit inspired St. Luke to write, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Again, our theme this morning is on vocation and witness. So to begin the sermon this morning, I want to tell you a little story that I heard once about two brothers, Tom, the older brother, and Harry, the younger brother. Now, Tom was a little bit older in years from his brother Harry. They were both raised in a good Christian home, both baptized as babies, both went to Sunday school, and of course, in time, catechism class. Both of them, when they were confirmed, told their mother that they were committed to serving the Lord. They were committed to dedicating their lives to Jesus. As one might expect, mom was pretty thrilled. In fact, the way that she saw it, she was expecting she would have not one, but two pastors in the family in short time. Each boy remained very active in their church throughout high school, helping out with the youth group, assisting with worship services, acolyting, doing the, uh, the, the, the preparation for the Lord's Supper, and just about anything that they could. In time, even becoming leaders in their youth group. Now, Tom, after graduating high school, he went on to college and eventually on to seminary, where he soon after entered the holy ministry. Mom was practically bursting with pride the day that Tom was ordained. Her firstborn son had kept his promise and was entering full-time ministry as a pastor. Harry, while he was in high school, well, Alongside everything else that he was doing, he decided to get a job at the local gas station owned by a man named Richard. Now here I need to digress just a little bit, and I want to note that the story really kind of takes place in the 1960s, back when gas stations were not called gas stations, they were called service stations. And of course, service stations were where you went to get just about anything you needed from your car, because not only did they give gas, But they also had oil, tires. You could get an engine rebuilt at most of your corner service stations as well. An attendant at a service station wasn't just somebody who stood at the cashier. No, when they heard that bell ring, when you rolled over that little hose, they'd come out. It was full service. They'd pump your gas for you. They'd top off your oil for you. They'd wash your windshield for you. It was all part of the full service of a service station. In fact, most people back in that day would go to a service station to get their vehicles fixed. They wouldn't take it to a dealership. They wouldn't take it to one of these other little shops. It was generally done at a service station. Anyway, uh, enough digression. So when Harry graduated high school, well, he decided he didn't want to go on to college. Instead, he continued to work for Richard at the service station. And as one might have expected, his mother was more than a little disappointed. She dreamed of having two pastors in the family, two full-time servants of the Lord. Harry, she felt, had reneged on the promise that he made at his confirmation. But she kept her disappointment to herself. So as far as Harry goes, he continued to attend worship services regularly. He remained very active in his church, even becoming a leader in his church as a layman, all the while working at Richard's service station. So one day, Harry's mother decides to drop by the service station. She wants to see her son, and she wants to take him out to lunch. Harry was finishing up working on a particular vehicle, so... Mom waited in the little waiting room that those service stations always had. And while she was in the office of the service station, well, a customer came in to pick up his vehicle that was finished up. So as Richard was ringing this man up, he stopped. And looking at the bill, he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. It seems that there's a bit of an error on your bill. 
Let me call in Harry. He's actually the one who did the work on your vehicle. So he calls for Harry. And of course, in comes Harry. And Richard says, Harry, I noticed that you were working pretty late last night on Mr. Smith's car. But I don't see the hours here on the bill. How late did you work? Well, Harry responded, well, Mr. Smith, or well, well, Richard, it's hard to keep these names straight, my goodness. He said, well, Richard, I was here pretty late. In fact, I worked until about 10 o'clock last night. However, I decided not to put the hours down because I was actually fixing a mistake that I had made earlier on the car. If I hadn't made that mistake, well, all these extra hours wouldn't be necessary. I wouldn't have had to stay late. So I figured I would work on my own time so that I wouldn't have to add the hours to the bill. So Richard excused Harry, and Harry went back to finish up, clean up, before he went out to lunch with Mom. But pretty much as soon as Harry left the room, Richard said that both to both Harry's mother as well as to Mr. Smith, you know what? That Harry is the very best mechanic that I have. Not only that, and probably more importantly, he's actually the best Christian that I know. Harry's mom was a little bewildered. How could that be? Richard knew both Tom and Harry. Tom was a pastor who left the area. Harry was still here, and he was just a service station worker. Why would Mr. Richard say that he might be the best Christian that he knows? So she asked him. And this is what Mr. Richard had to say. He said, from Harry. His faith is not just words. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's how he lives every day, and I see it. You know, I've started attending church services again. And it's all because of Harry. It's because in him, in how he lives, in the things that I see, I can see Christ. Harry doesn't preach at me, at least not with words. His life and an occasional word here or there really get the message across to me that Jesus is important to him in his life. And that message comes through loud and clear. That day, Harry's mother learned that there was more than one way to be in full-time service to the Lord. Because Harry, just like his older brother Tom, was living a life that was dedicated to Jesus. It was just a life that looked a little different. This idea that we are called to live for the Lord in whatever place the Lord has placed us is really covered under the topics of vocation and witness. And it's pretty well, I think, reflected in our readings from the book of Acts this morning, where we see that the church, right from the very beginning, took the words of Jesus pretty seriously when he was calling his church to take care of people, including the orphans and even the widows. And the apostles, like good, overachieving ministers, were trying to take care of everything themselves, including all of the church's charitable activities. But what they very quickly realized was that they were far too spread thin. So problems began to develop. They weren't able to take care of enough stuff because they didn't have enough hands with just the twelve of them. So the church appointed seven men to take care of the charitable work of the church, and they called them deacons. These men were not apostles. They were lay people. Today, we might call them laymen or administrators or any manner or things because they were in charge of administrating the church's aid in one way or another. They weren't called to be preachers, although Stephen apparently was pretty good with his speech. In fact, Stephen's life and witness were so profound and powerful that he very quickly got the attention of the Jewish leaders. In fact, this layman, Stephen, became the first martyr of the church. 
So this deacon, this administrator, this layman, lived for the Lord not only with his mouth, not only at worship, but in his daily walk and life. You see, just because he didn't have a calling as a pastor didn't mean he didn't have a calling from the Lord. Just because he wasn't writing sermons or Bible studies or praying for hours on end for the members of the congregation didn't mean that he wasn't serving the Lord 24-7. Like Harry, these seven men we learn of in Acts served the Lord wherever they went in life. In fact, I can say here today that each of us here, each person in this sanctuary this morning also has vocations, callings from the Lord. In fact, you have more than one calling from the Lord. And you know what? Not all of our vocations and callings are actually the same. In fact, we're not even all equipped the same for these vocations. And yet the Lord still gives them to us and prepares us specifically for the tasks He will give us. Did you know that as soon as you're born, you've already got a calling from God? You have the calling as child of your parents. But it's not simply limited to that. There's other very common vocations that we find all over. Things like brother and sister. Friend, neighbor, spouse, student, employer, employee, citizen, parent. And there's a, a whole bunch of other ones that I could list, but I think that's more than enough to list for now. But our most important calling is our calling as children of God. God has called us unto Himself. He has adopted us into His own family through our baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection. But here's the rub. We have all of these different callings from the Lord in our life. And yet, so often we overlook them. It's easy to overlook them. It's easy to see them as being of, of very little value because they're so common to us. Sure, some people might think, maybe the pastor has a calling from the Lord. That could be an obvious one. Maybe missionaries, maybe seminary professors or parochial school teachers. But not me. I'm just a mechanic. I'm just a factory worker. I'm just a tree cutter. The Lord doesn't have a call on my life. Some people might even broaden their view. They might include all school teachers. They might include doctors or nurses or paramedics. They might include funeral directors, many of those jobs that a lot of people aren't able to come through on. But in the end, they'd still want to say, not me. I don't have a call from the Lord. I'm just 10 years old. Or I'm 90 years old. What can I do? The problem is, thinking like this is actually quite unbiblical. The Lord calls us in many and various ways. But sometimes it's difficult to see what the Lord is wanting to do with us. In our reading from Acts chapter 6, we see Stephen and six other men who are appointed to a new role appointed to a new calling, a new vocation as leaders in the church. This doesn't mean that they didn't have vocations before. In fact, it was the very testimony of their lives as they followed through with their vocations that lifted them up before the congregation so that they might become leaders in the church, so that they might have their positions as deacons. It's as Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little will also be dishonest in much. 
These men, alongside Stephen, who were appointed as deacons, had been faithful in their vocations. And so it was believed they would continue to be faithful, even if the church gave them some more. In the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23, there's a master who is supposed to represent God, who says to his servant, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Again, the idea is to be faithful wherever the Lord has you right now. In your current callings and vocations. Because such vocation, or such such faithfulness in your vocation leads to the Lord giving you more responsibility. More responsibility in his kingdom. And we never quite know what that's going to look like. But knowing that it's the Lord who gives it to us, we can be assured that it will be the very best it could be. To use a metaphor from the 1960s, we are called to grow and even to bloom where we have been planted. But then that really begs the question, How are we to live in our vocations? What is it that God desires from us? Well, the general answer is to live in faith toward God and in love toward one another. The problem is that due to our fallen sinful nature, it's easy for us to get confused about just what this means. So, to that end, now that we have the hymnals back in the pews, I would like for you to grab a hymnal from in front of you. If you would, please crack it open to page 328. What do we find there on page 328? The table of duties. Does anybody know what that's from? Yeah, from the small catechism. Did you know that every one of these hymnals contains Luther's small catechism? If you didn't before, well, you do now. Our hymnals are a wonderful resource for us to use. Not only do they have the small catechism, and of course many of our divine service liturgies, as well as hymns. We even got a whole bunch of the psalms and prayers and more and more. But maybe I'll get into what's in the hymnal sometime later. But before you, now, you have the table of duties from the small catechism. This is here to give us real guidance for the many vocations that we find on the list. If you look at it, Luther has scriptures that are appropriate for many of the important vocations that we see in life. It's got scriptures appropriate for pastors and parishioners, for husbands and wives, for parents and children, for governments and its citizens, employees and their employers, and so on. But you may know of a vocation that you have that's not covered on this list. And let me let you know, there are a lot of them. But, even if you can't find yours on the list, well, at the end, Luther has a whole bunch of passages that are really general passages that are good for anybody in any calling. Why do I point all of this out? Why do I think that this is important enough to have you all crack open your hymnals to the table of duties? Well, because you and I, we are baptized children of God. We are living in the power of God's grace. We serve the Lord all the time, wherever we are in our life. The question is how well we are serving Him at any given time. But we need to realize that God Himself is the one who has given us our vocations. He has placed us in them so that we can serve Him and so that we can be of service to others. You do have callings from God. 
Each of us has God-given work to do. You don't have to choose between trying to serve God and trying to do your job. You don't have to try to choose between serving God and serving your family or serving your country or so on and so forth. You can serve God in these roles that you find before you wherever the Lord has called you to work. God calls us to put the best construction on all things, working at everything as for the Lord because in the end, everything we do is for the Lord. He wants us to show His life and light and love to people in this world through our day-to-day lives. We are all called to be witnesses of the Easter resurrection hope that we have of Jesus wherever we're at. You can do this simply by being a good worker at your job. You can do this simply by taking the time to share some kind and loving words with someone that you know is struggling. Or even just some kind and loving words with the cashier at Pick and Save or Festival Foods, whichever one you prefer. We can do this simply by inviting others to come and to join us for worship at church. Not all of us are called to be ministers of the Word. Not all of us are called to be pastors and preachers and the like. That's okay. One of the things that God has given you in your life to help you is your church. You may not have all of the answers, and you know what? We as pastors don't either, although sometimes it might seem like we do. But you don't have to have all the answers. If you know that someone is struggling in their faith, you can still ask them to come to church. You don't have to have even much conversation with them. You can lead them to someone else that you know has it figured out better than you do. It's one of the reasons that we as pastors are here. I may not know everything, but I know a lot about a few things. And Scripture happens to be one of them. For good reason, right? How could I teach it if I don't know or understand it myself? I've got one more story I want to leave you with this morning. A pastor was visiting a factory worker. The pastor came up to him and he said, Good man, are you a Christian? The factory worker replied, yes, I consider myself to be a Christian. The pastor asked him, are you bringing others to Christ in his church? And the man replied, no, sir, I'm not. But that's not my business, that is your business. You are called to preach. So the pastor, who of course always carried his Bible around with him, cracked his Bible open to Acts chapter 8, verse 4. And he asked the man to go ahead and read it. So the factory worker read it. He read, Those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. The man said, well, okay, I understand that that may be true, but those were the apostles. Ah, the pastor said, would you go ahead and do me a favor and read the first verse of the chapter? So the man went back, looked down at the Bible, to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, where the man then read, all except the apostles were scattered. All except the apostles were scattered, and those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. Jesus is present with us every time we gather together around his word. He promises where three or more are gathered around my word, there I am among them. He also promises us here in this holy meal to be present with us once more, in, with, and under the simple elements of bread and wine. He's with us at baptism, 
with us in those holy waters, with us every time we remember who and whose we are as baptized children of God. And Jesus' continued presence among us reminds us of what our purpose is here on earth. And it's something that flows out of his callings to us, especially from his calling to us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where he says, go. But really what he says is, as you're going, as you're living out your life, disciple people. Share Jesus with anyone that you can that they too might become disciples and followers of Jesus as they learn God's Word and as they are baptized into the cross, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Again, not everyone is called to be a pastor. And yet all who belong to Christ receive the power to be His witnesses. First and foremost to their families, then to their friends and their neighbors even with those who disagree with them. And through our work together as a church, through our offerings and our prayers on behalf of others, our our witness reaches other people here in Nina. But it's not just limited to Nina because what we do here actually reaches out to many people across the state of Wisconsin and even across the world through our mission. Jesus hasn't taken us to our heavenly home yet. He still has some witness work for us to do in this world. And again, from our first reading, from Acts chapter 1, he assures us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This empowering from God comes to us through the Holy Spirit's work as started in baptism, which continues every time we hear the word. It continues every time we receive Jesus bodily in, with, and under the bread and the wine in communion. This is the Lord giving to us His strengthening of our faith and of our love toward others so that we can be of use to Him in His kingdom building. He says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Not pastors but witnesses, personally sharing God's Word, supporting the missions and the opportunities of His church. God has handcrafted each and every one of us to be His witness in a particular way. He's given each of us different skills, different abilities, even different interests to prepare us for the blessed task of being His witnesses where and when and with whom He places us. So let us be intentional about taking up the callings of our Lord wherever we are. Let us be witnesses here in this place among one another that we might strengthen each other and witnesses out there beyond our church door out in our community so that the peace and the love of Jesus can go forth from us and rest on all those we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise now as we prepare to make confession of our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. 
And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with joy to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe... We continue with the prayers of the church. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their needs. Gracious God, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Heavenly Father, hear the cries of those who awaken to face another day of injustice, prejudice, and oppression. Give them hope in your promises. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. Give patience and guidance to clergy and lay leaders of the church, that through them the gospel will move many to seek Christ and His salvation. The Lord will not cast off forever. He will have compassion according to the abundance of His steadfast love. In Your great love, O Lord, Give strength and healing to all who are enduring long-term illnesses and difficult treatments. Help medical people and institutions find new ways of alleviating pain and reversing recurring symptoms. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. Give wisdom to the leaders of the nations, protection to the armed forces deployed, and guidance to law enforcement that peace may break out between nations and our neighborhoods may be places of calm and connected community. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. We pray especially for those near and dear to us, especially those that we know of that are in need of health and healing. So this day, O Lord, we pray for Brian, the father of Greg, for Jill, for Sharon, for Roger, for Ernie, the father of Kim. Heavenly Father, grant them health, peace, and relief as fits your gracious plans for them. Gracious God, we also ask for your blessings on those celebrating wedding anniversaries. We lift up before you David and Marilyn on their 58th, Fritz and Audrey on their 61st, Ed and Karen on their 49th, Phil and Joan on their 61st, and George and Susan on their 50th. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant each of these a greater measure of love for one another, and that you would preserve them as a witness of our God's saving love and forgiveness, especially reflected in marriage. We also beseech you, O oh Lord, for blessings on the 2021 LWML Convention that their continued work among us would be of benefit to your kingdom building, and let us be of use to you and to the Lutheran women in mission as we work together for the spread of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The Macedonian Christians' abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Open our eyes and hearts, our time and resources, gracious God, to see where you call us, that we might share your word and blessings and be part of your answers to the prayers we bring before you. For these and all other things you would have us ask of you, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. O Lord, our God, we give thanks to you forever. Amen. We continue with the presentation of the offering. Thank you. Mm. 
We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to You, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by His glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth, adore heaven and earth with full of thanksgiving at the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest. Sing Hosanna. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. And now may this, the true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Now depart in his peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn, Pass It On, after which we'll have the recognition of the high school seniors, or at least a prayer for them if we don't have any here, and then just a few quick announcements. In looking out here now, I don't think that I see any of our uh, high school students or our graduates. So why don't we go ahead and have a quick prayer for them and then a few announcements. So let us pray. Almighty God, we ask for your powerful protection over our high school and our college graduates as they go to different places and embark on new journeys in life. We ask, O Lord, that you would grant your blessings upon Megan, upon Anne Marie, and upon Aiden, as well as our college students, Craig and Taylor. We ask that you would guide, protect, bless, and keep each of these. Watch over their paths and keep their footsteps secure. Protect their coming and their going. We ask that you would cover them from behind and guard them from all evil. And remind them that you are their constant shield and defender from the enemy's attacks. Grant to them a deep awareness of sin that they would be quick to confess when they have done wrong. And know the healing balm of the gospel through which we are forgiven of all our sins in Jesus Christ. 
Help them when they face temptations in this life and remind them that you are always there, ready and able to help them to overcome. We ask that you would guard their steps from evil, give them diligence in turning away from that which is wrong, and grant them a greater measure of faith in you and love toward one another. All these things we pray in the name and for the sake of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, just a few announcements this morning before we all kind of scatter to wherever it is we're doing next. Um, Next Sunday is the 4th of July, and we're only going to have one service on Sunday. It'll be one service at 9 a.m., which will be followed by this year's pancake breakfast. What a wonderful opportunity for us to do that here on site. Um, I also want to note that we still do need some help and assistance for the pancake breakfast, so if you would be willing, uh, please take a look at the poster boards that are back there in the narthex uh, and see if there's a place that you might be able to fill in. Uh, I think we especially need help right now, though, with the teardown. I don't think anyone has signed up so far for that, and I prefer for it not to just be myself over the course of a week. That's probably what will end up happening if nobody signs up for it. (laughs) So, um, alongside that, uh, there are flyers back there that you can take to hand out to people. And actually, just this weekend, I made up these little cards, okay, that give some basic information for the, uh, the pancake breakfast, and it's just a brief invitation. Uh, the hope is that we would be letting other people know that we're doing this so that people in our community might join us for worship and hopefully for the pancake breakfast. Um, But I know that some of you are probably not necessarily that willing to express that to people. So this is a really easy way to do that. In fact, the top of it says 4th of July, and then it says you're invited. Pretty simple, right? There's an invitation you can hand off to just about anybody to invite them to join us for church or for the pancake breakfast. So if you're willing to do that, to grab, you know, one or more of these to hand them out to people, please do so. There's, uh, there's copies of them on the coffee bar, on the help desk, as well as on one of the little tables that are out there. And again, if you might forget some of the information, this might be good for you too. So please, you know, grab at least one of those to hand out, if not more. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, beginning in July, we're going to see the return of the use of the hymnals and the songbooks. Um, so that's a, that should be a wonderful thing that will actually help us to cut down on much of the paper costs we've uh, incurred over the last year, just from printing up everything in the bulletins. Um, but this is also a, a good opportunity for us to, well, get back into the habit of using it. Because the hymnal, again, is a wonderful resource that has a lot more in it than just simply uh, hymns and songs and things like that. But again, we'll talk about that sometime in the near future. I also want to make one more announcement, and that is that there is still time to join us, if you would like, for our Sunday morning Bible study entitled Family Trees and Olive Branches. Um, We haven't even watched the first actual video that goes along with the first chapter, so you really haven't missed out on much. You'd only be, well, since we don't have Sunday, or since we don't have class next weekend, you'd actually have two whole weeks to get caught up with the first three chapters. So, if you're interested in joining us, we have extra books. We just need extra bodies. Otherwise, uh, does anyone have any other important announcements that need to be made? Yes, good sir. How important it is, but we do have the two college graduates here. So, I think it might be appropriate if they stand and we recognize them for their accomplishment as well. Let's go ahead and do that. Come on. Come on, Taylor. Go ahead and sit down. I'm not going to go through the whole rigmarole and ask you to tell us where you're going and all that kind of stuff. We're proud of you. We are very... Uh Uh-oh. So now I'm getting called to the floor by my wife. People can talk to you after the service if they'd like to gain more information. I'm not going to embarrass you too much now. All right, well, any other important announcements? All right, good. Well, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.